department session. Once again, warm welcome to our big department. Let's start our freelance session. Ladies and gentlemen, we rarely get this kind of opportunity to listen to the words of knowledgeable speakers. Today, our speakers are Dr. Murthy, Dr. Murthy Murthy Krishnan and Dr. Balasubramanian. So now, currently, our freelance session speaker is Dr. Murthy Murthy Krishnan. Currently working as professor and head of the department of electrical engineering at Narayana Institute of Technology and Science, Hyderabad. He is also a member of professional bodies IEEE and IETE. At this contest, I request Mrs. Barthi to read the profile of our speaker. <coughs> An awarded gold medal from PhD Institute of Technology, Coimbatore. He is MTech in Electrical Engineering from IIT Madras and MS and PhD in Electrical Engineering with presentation in Microelectronics from Virginia Technological University, USA. He has over 13 years of industrial experience in USA and over 9 years of teaching and research experience in educational institutions. Presently, he is working as professor and head of the Department of Electrical Engineering at G. Narayana Institute of Technology and Science, Hyderabad. He received awards, Outstanding Employee Award at LSI Glossy Corporation, USA, <coughs> Volunteer of the Year Award from Community Companions, a non-profit social service organization, San Jose, USA. He is a member of Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, ICT, Fellow of Institution of Engineers in India, and Fellow of Institute of Electronics and Telecommunications Engineers, IETE. His areas of research include image processing, real-assay design and fabrication, embedded systems and solar photovoltaics. He was involved in installation of solar TV power plants at Jean Arendma Institute of Technology and Science, Hyderabad. He was also heading the Entrepreneurial Development Cell and GNI ATS Stain Based Center for Renewable Union Person as our speaker for our today's session. Thank you sir for giving this talk. Doctor, Murti Murti Krishnan to deliver keynote address on recent trends in embedded systems. So, some of you can probably come to the front. Some of you who are sitting in the back, please come to the front. There are a lot of vacant seats. Actually, this is very much important for the students. So, what we are going to do, uh, how many of you are uh, PTEC students? How many of you are PTEC students? Quite a few numbers. How about EPTEC students? Okay. Have numbers? Okay. So, how many of you have gone through some of the courses in the embedded systems? No one? Okay. So, in that case, what we will do? We will start with the, what is embedded systems. Of course, you might have gone through a course in the Microprocess, microcontrollers, right? So we'll start with that, and then we'll slowly go on to this uh, embedded systems. And uh, as you know, the embedded systems is a very, very wide topic. So just to give you an idea about uh, where the embedded system started and where it is going, and then uh, I was also going to show you some of the work we are doing with the industries. So I'll show you some of the kits. If anybody is interested, uh, I can guide you through how to get these kits or to uh, do some projects on that. First, uh, let me thank the management, the faculty of the engineering students, and the staff to invite me to give this lecture. And, uh, okay. So, as far as my talk is concerned, if you have any questions, please ask me. Okay, please ask me. I will be able to answer the question. And uh, if I am not able to answer the question, probably we will talk after the talk. So, in general, I am going to talk about uh, what is the microprocessor versus the microcontroller. You know, most of you are familiar with microprocessor and microcontroller, but we will start with that, just to give you an idea. And then we will go through embedded systems. What is embedded system? Why it is so important? And in the morning, there were several speakers talking about why what embedded, embedded system and what are the challenges. So, we will try to address some of the challenges, how it is being overcome, and so on. Then, uh, as far as the, this particular session is concerned, it's going to be focusing more on advances in the embedded system. 
For example, I went to college in 1978-83, and uh, those days the microprocessor was just coming in, coming into the market, and uh, we were trying out uh, the 8080 kit. Nowadays, 8080 is not even the market today, so now 8086 is more common. Uh, then there is a lot of advances in the past few years. Of course, it is still going on. So we'll try to show what are the advances <coughs> and the trends. And of course, there are some challenges, challenges that uh, we come across. And that this is the first part of the talk. The second part of the talk, again, that is my <coughs> suggestion is that when we do some codes, especially the codes like microprocessors, microcontrollers, or embedded systems, we should also do some projects. So now we are using certain platforms like PSOC, k Basie, and WSB and so on. Now for the speakers today, he is from Red Pine Scissors. He has donated one of the kids. So I will show you the kids. You may not be able to go through the entire details, but at least give an introduction for what is this, then how we can use it for our projects. So first is, again, most of this information is available on the internet. I took information from several sources. My last slide will include um, the sources of information. It could be some manual, it could be some website, it could be some books and so on. So I'll give you the information about where these slides are from. So most of us know that the microprocessor is basically a CPU, right? So almost all of us have learned about this um, microprocessor course. So it's a CPU only. There are no peripherals inside, there is no memory inside, there are no IO ports, no time and counter and so on. So it is just a CPU. By itself, it's not going to be able to do anything. So we have to have some way of interfacing with the outside world. So outside world could be keyboard, um, display, LED, LCD, and sensors and so on. So microprocessor by itself cannot do anything. So we have to have some memory that is wrong, read-only memory. And then we have to have some random access memory that is a reader writer and several peripherals. We need to have input, output, and so on. So we start to connect from outside. That's a microprocessor. So a microprocessor is probably a generic one. So you can come build a computer and uh, do some programming and so on. But uh, when we come to a system, microprocessor is not going to be able to do the job. The reason is that we need to have a read only memory. ROM and then random access memory. You need to have some peripherals that is input output ports, you need to have some serial ports, some communication, and so on. And also, we need to be able to connect uh, to different peripherals, suppose if you want to connect, right? So, in that case, in the microprocessor case, we need to have all these chips outside. We have to have these chips outside, and uh, in the microcontroller case, most of these components are inside the same chip. So that is the first step towards integrating the CPU, that is the computing part of it, and uh, the memory, and some of the filters into the same chip. So that is probably the first step towards embedded system. Embedded system. Because in the embedded system, such as, we'll see some examples, what are the embedded systems, and then why we need to integrate all those things inside the same chip. Right. So microcontrollers, the main <coughs> application was the piece still embedded systems. So you might ask, what is the embedded system? So how many of you have cell phones? How many of you have cell phones? Everybody, right? So everybody has a cell phone. So how many of you use washing machine at home? Quite a few. What about TV? <coughs> TV, right? So all these are embedded systems. We have a chip inside, and the chip is used for specific purpose, specific task, which is supposed to carry out a specific task. So that means that that chip has to contain CPU, some processing power, and then it has to have some peripherals, maybe some kind of keyboard or keypad where you can enter the data, and then it has to do some work, maybe the timer, and then it has to control some activity. So it could be a cell phone, if it is a cell phone, you have to make a phone call, see the phone call, and uh, send them SMS and so on. So embedded system is basically a processor that is being used for a specific purpose. Specific purpose could be washing machine, or it could be a cell phone, it could be a DVD, or set of box, and so on. All right. So now, originally when the microprocessor was released in the market, 
there were no microcontrollers. No. So it was mainly used for computer applications. When we were students, the first microprocessors that we received, they were mainly for uh, computers. Of course, the industry was using the microprocessors for the industrial control applications, some sensing applications, but they were not that popular in those days, 1970s. Then slowly, the embedded system applications, such as you have the cell phone here, camera, microwave, then the automobile, automobile is a very, very big industry that has been used to be, that is using the embedded systems, aircraft, uh, space shuttle, rockets, space station, and then robotics, all these use embedded systems. So as you can see, about 99% of the applications, 99% of the applications of the controllers, vector controllers, it goes into embedded systems, not the general purpose computers. So that is very amazing. So some, this is another slide that shows the application pretty much the same as in the previous slide, this is from a different source. And as you can see here, it starts from the aircraft, we have the printers, then the camera, mouse, and then DVD or set-top box. We have a GPS device, cell phone, again, some car navigation system, and so on. So all these applications use the embedded system. Today morning somebody was speaking about the automatic cars, completely offboarding automatic driver's cars and uh, they can drive themselves. So I'll come to that in a little bit later. But, so where is the embedded system? Now that we are using the embedded system, where we have this So each person uses about 200 chips per, 250 chips per day, approximately. So maybe in the US and other countries. At least in India, we can say that we are using about uh, 200, maybe 150 chips. Where do we use? We may not even realize, right? So some of the chips, copy chips are shared ATM, automatic telemetry, right? <coughs> cell phone, and then personal assistant, probably your uh, different kind of device now. And then about 80 chips in the home application, home application. So it could be washing machine, DVD player, TV, remote controls, mouse, and so on. So we have about 80 chips over there. And then about 40 chips at work, maybe in the college, maybe in the industry. So printers, computers, all these devices, fax machines, telephones, everything uses the chips. And then the remaining chips might be the other places. Other places, of course, you have the cars, and even some two dealers might have these chips. And one statistic says about each person uses about 1 billion transistors. It's a very amazing. A lot of transistors we use, we don't even realize. All right. So, what are the characteristics of embedded systems? Many, I am uh, going from the basics because not many of you have exposure to the embedded systems. If you already have an exposure, please forgive me. So, we will go through the embedded system. What is the embedded system and how the trend is moving? And again, I will um, distribute this presentation to your uh, organizers, so you don't have to take notes, whatever is there on the slides, but it's good. All right, so the embedded system, originally it was just a simple function. You know, for example, when we were students, we didn't have cell phone. All we had was the landline. And then the pages came about. I don't know how many of you are aware of the pages. Probably in India, they just took the whole thing, right? In the US, what happened was, I worked in the industry, the industry works 24 hours a day, some days a week. So, ours is a production industry, some days a week, 24 hours a day. So, we used to wear pages. Similarly, the doctors used to wear pages. Suppose we need to be called, they will call from a particular landline and then enter that number. Enter the number, it comes to the page as a text message, only numbers will come. So, we have to call that number and talk to that person. And that person will say, okay, there is an emergency, come here. Right? So, that was originally the embedded application. So very only one single function. All it can do is receive a text message. That's all it does. Now the embedded systems are moving towards multifunction. They have already moved towards multifunction. So how many of your cell phones are smartphones? Almost everybody, right? Except my right? So my phone is still this, then of course I have an iPhone, right? So I just wanted to show you. Anyway, so now our cell phones can do calls. They can do the text messaging and they can even access the internet and then we can browse and we can do the social networking like Facebook, Twitter, all those things. So that means that 
or cell phones are becoming more and more complex. And that, that's the same case with other embedded systems also. Of course, cell phone is the good example. Other embedded systems also becoming more and more complex. So we have to be able to uh, be able to handle that complexity. That have this complexity. How do we do that? And uh, some of the speakers from the industry they were telling that security is becoming very important. Information and data security is becoming very important. And uh, we'll just touch upon how the security is being handled. Complex personality means you have to have complex algorithms. It cannot just do some sending a text message and so on. It should be able to do some computation. It should be able to do some communication and so on. So communications are, we have different protocols. And uh, there are survey constraints. So this is the biggest problem, right? So as far as the embedded system is concerned, it is going to go be a device like the cell phone, right? So originally, I used to tell in, that, tell in my class. So originally, when they introduced the cell phone, it used to be like a brick, very big, right? And the battery, somebody has to carry around the battery separate, or it has to be mounted on the car, and then the cell phone has to be used only in the car. It used to call this the smartphone. Nowadays, the cell phone is very small, right? You put it in your pocket. But still, you should have all these functions. Now, <coughs> the constraints are low cost. For example, only the cell phones must have costed about 1 lakh. Only the rich people could afford, and probably the government officials, ministers, and so on, or then the government pays for it. And of course, they have to have communication all the time. And the military, police, and all those people, they used to send carry cell phones. Nowadays, Anybody can have cell phone. Probably India is one of the biggest market for the cell phones. So the cost is low, maybe about a thousand rupees and above. And it has to be lightweight, you should be able to carry around in your pocket. And then no power consumption. Again, this is becoming very really important. So if you charge your cell phone, it has to go for maybe two days without recharge. Right? Otherwise, you're not, not going to be happy. So these are all the constraints. Limited memory. You cannot have, let's say, terabytes of memory like what you have on a laptop or a desktop computer. So these are not the constraints. So a embedded system, we should be able to handle all those things. What do they address? Another thing is safety critical. So in the case of aircraft, rockets, missiles, of uh, space shuttle, space shuttle is not, uh, it's grounded, in, uh, grounded now. Medical instruments such as the X-ray, MRI, CT scan, and of course the automobiles, many of us won't know what goes into the cars, right? So how many of you know how to fix the cars? Can you repair the cars? Not many, right? We can have even change the tire. So if you look at the old cars like ambassadors, there are still some ambassadors like when you are running around in the cities. So if you look at the ambassadors, ambassador cars, you open the hood, that is the front, and it is just the engine, it is purely mechanical. So maybe some electrical parts are there, but not much electronics. Probably there was no electronics at all, right? So nowadays, any car, you take the Mark Payton or you go to BMW, Mercedes-Benz, all the cars will have a lot of electronics. Okay. So that is how the electronic systems has invaded into almost all the areas. And of course, we are the bits. So here, the safety is very, very important. For example, if you have a car, and then you are driving the car, and then you are applying a brake. The brake is, the brake is being controlled by, let's say, an embedded system. Maybe a microcontroller. And if the brake fails, we are going to have a big problem. And similarly, the aircraft, there were so many accidents. accidents. And uh, I was reading about that in Apollo, the Apollo series of rockets, we may not be familiar with that. That was the first set of rockets that the US launched towards the moon Apollo 11, Apollo 12, 13, and so on. So, first set of rockets. The most critical part of the Apollo 13, I mean, Apollo series, the whole series was the controller, controller of that Apollo. So that was that critical. So now it is becoming more and more important, more complex, and you have several constraints. How do they handle the constraints? So that is why the trend is coming. So this is another view of where this embedded market lies. Now, as you can see, automotive, that is the cars, automobiles, they are one of the uh, biggest users of the embedded systems. Many, many computers, many, many microcontrollers, they go into that. So, for example, fuel, fuel ignition. We have a microcontroller, similarly, engine control, brake system, the airbag, the airbag is coming in many parts now. 
and similarly the brake system. So they have all these controlled by the microcontroller, individual microcontrollers, and that they are all networked in the car itself. So like a small network itself. And consumer electronics, of course, this is another big area. Static to TV, set of box, this could be your, your uh, cable modem or satellite modem. And then uh, you have kitchen appliances such as the microwave, washing machine, all those things use embedded microcontrollers. Then industrial <coughs> robotics and uh, the industry I use to work for is a semiconductor industry. We use a lot of automatic handlers. So very rarely the people are handling the products. Now we just call control with the robotics. And similarly, automobile industry also, manufacturing industry, they use a lot of robotics. And uh, office automation, of course, we are familiar with the Xerox copy machine, and the fax machine, printers, scanners, all these things use the embedded systems. And networking, of course, this is another important area. So that we have routers, hubs, and switches. All those things use embedded microcontrollers. So this is another view. Okay, this is pretty much the same thing. So we'll skip this slide. Okay. So where did we start? And again, the microcontrollers. Of course, we talk about who was the first. Uh, Company that made the microprocessor. Anybody remembers which was the first company that uh, introduced the microprocessor? Intel, right? Intel. Intel they came up with an idea of microprocessor because some Japanese company came to them and said we wanted to make a printing calculator, desktop printing calculator, 12 chips. So Intel said we are going to make only 4 chips, right? Integrate some of the functions and make only 4 chips. So Intel came up with the idea of microprocessor and then we realized that there is much more requirement that we need to have processing power, we need to have some memory, we need to have some ports, input output ports on the same chip. So they also started working on the microcontrollers, 8051. A lot of us are familiar with what we have in our ANU curriculum also, 8051. Right? And uh, of course, Whenever some company comes up with some product, especially in the US, it is not just one company that is coming with some product. So there are always many companies working in parallel. So Texas Instruments is another company, and they, can, they had a lot of inventions those days, including the first uh, IC, integrated circuit, along with Intel. So they also had their first microcontroller that is called MS 1000. That was in the 1970s, 1971, 72, that time period. Of course, it continuously evolves, these microcontrollers, they continuously evolve, they add more and more functionality. <coughs> Anybody remembers what is the, the width, the bus width of this uh, 8051? How many bits it can handle? 8051? 8 bits or 16 bits? 8 bits, 8 bits, right? So, what is the bus 8 bits? Because most of the applications are very, very simple. You read some temperature and then you compare the temperature with what was the cell temperature and then control. That's how it is, very simple application. It doesn't need more than a bit. And another thing is the technology, fabrication. So fabrication could not do beyond 8 bits, right? And that, now, as we have seen, the embedded system functionality is becoming more and more complex. It does do a lot more things, right? So that means that 8 bit is not going to be sufficient. So you have to go to 16 bit or 32 bit or beyond because our requirements are much more. So many companies came into picture and Freescale was part of Motorola. Motorola spun out their uh, semiconductor division into Freescale and then ARM is another big, big company, right? So most of them are familiar with ARM. So ARM is not making their own microprocessors or microcontrollers. What they do is they do the design and then give it to other companies. Other companies use this design in their design and then build the chip around it. So ARM is providing what they call it as a core, core to other companies. But nevertheless, ARM is one of the biggest companies that uses and that use the microcontrollers. Texas Instruments, of course, it is as good as Intel as far as the control applications are concerned. They have their own line of microprocessors, microcontrollers such as MS430, DaVinci, Overmatch, and so on. And uh, other companies like Microchip, they had the big microcontrollers, and Atmel, APR, and so on. So now there are other companies. NXP was part of Philips, so Philips spun off this as a separate company. 
So there are at least 10 major pairs, maybe more than 10 major pairs, as far as the microcontrollers are concerned. So the reason is that there are so many applications. So one of the statistics says that for every person on this planet, on the earth, there will be 10 devices that will be connected to the internet. So internet of things, right? IoT. There will be 10 devices. That means that you have to make so many devices, you have to make the devices connect to the internet. So that means you have to have so many chips. You need to have so many chips. That's why all these companies are competing for the same business. Alright. So what is the next step? So first step is very simple microcontroller that connected to the very simple embedded system such as the temperature measurement and the temperature control or probably uh, through AC control. And then the next one is probably the um, cell phone where you need to have more processing power and so on. And even that is not sufficient. We need to build the whole system on a single chip. Single chip. So again, several companies are moving in that direction. I will show you some of the examples. Alcatra is one company, this is very famous for FPGA, so the three programming <coughs> and then the CLD, CPLD and so on. So logic devices, the programming logic devices, PLDs. Alcatra is one, I didn't show this Xilinx, Xilinx also has a lot of products. Then Cypress is another company and they have a family of uh, processors called the ESA, that is programmable system on a chip. So probably at the end of this session, I will mention about this, I will show you some of their products. So they have something called the university program. Or any of these companies have something called university program. So what we do is we just write to them and they donate us the kids. One of the faculty members or any faculty members can be a part of that. And then uh, we can do some projects. We have been doing projects like that for about four years with our students. And the products are, products are very different. We have to develop new products and uh, communication projects and so on. So there's a lot of projects to do. Texas Instruments, they have their own system on a chip. Again, when we say system on a chip, it is a CPU, ports, the communication, and a lot more on a single chip. And also it is programmable. You can connect the way you want. You can also include some of the analog devices, such as operation amplifiers, and then uh, Unlock digital converters, digital unlock converters, PL, PLLs, and so on. All these other components also in the same chip. So that means that all you need is just one chip to build your whole system. Now, previously what we used to do, again, now also you might be doing that. You take 8051 or some such chip, and then if you want to have some other functionality, for example, you want to do ATC, what you do? You get another chip, try to interface that. So we spend a lot of time trying to interface. So industry people, they don't have much time. They have only probably three months to develop a particular product. Either they want to market it or their customers want to market it. So they have only three months. You don't have time to develop all these chips or maybe buy the chips, try to interface and so on. So they try to go in that way, system on a chip, right? So AMD has its own version of system on a chip, probably they bought from some other companies. But nonetheless, many, many companies, right? Just like we board, there are many companies that are moving in that direction. So we started with a very simple microcontroller, that is 1851, or big microcontroller. Next step is more of a multi-bit processors or 16-bit, 32 bit processors. Now it is system on a chip. Again, my suggestion is that in addition to what you do in your class, you might also want to read about this. Nowadays, we are going through the ACP accreditation, the PA accreditation. In that, they have more points for some of the topics that uh, we have covered from outside the syllabus. Right? So, this could be one. And also, you can conduct some workshop like this. So, we can have a more intensive workshop on a particular device. You can invite people from other, other institutes or from these companies. They will come and give you a workshop. Then, you can start working on the project. Okay. So having said that, having said that, where are we going? So that is the that is the topic of this particular presentation. And uh, as we have seen, our embedded systems are becoming more and more complex. It has to handle many many functionalities. It has to connect to the other devices, maybe routers, internet, and then maybe you have to connect to the Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and so on. 
So that means that, or so these are the topics we are going to cover under the trends. But again, I am not an expert in any of these renewable little bit. So I will just point out where the internet systems is moving towards and what we need to know. So these are the topics we will be covering. So how much time do you have? So we will complete the bench. What is that okay? What is that okay? So, of course, we have we are about halfway through. The last 10-15 minutes, we will try to show you the kits that we have, just to give you an idea of what. Alright. So, multi-core processors and the embedded systems are going towards wireless. It is not connected anymore, right? So, it has to communicate with other devices, maybe your computer, maybe with the internet, using the wireless communication. Open source technology, security, again, a lot of um, professors and the industry people, they talk about the information security that comes with the separate systems. And the device conventions, we talk about that, internetization and smart devices. All right. So why do we need multi-core process? What do we what do we mean by multi-core process? What do we mean by multi-core? We have more than one CPU, right? On the same chip. Why do we have to have more than one CPU? More processing power, right? We are not happy. See, for example, you are connected to the internet. You are trying to download a video, right? So the video takes a long time to download. So how many of you have that experience? It takes a long time, right? So when you go to YouTube and try to download something, it takes a long time. You want to speed it up. How do we speed it up? Either you have to go for a high speed processor or you have to go for a multi core processor. So most of the companies, they go for multi core processor because developing a high speed processor by technology is not that easy. And also initially it's going to be very expensive. So all they do is just include many ports on the same chip. Maybe two ports, four ports, eight ports and so on. So that is one, uh, one of the directions the embedded systems are doing, multiple processes. Original applications, they are very simple, home applications, microwave, washing machine, or temperature control. We don't need that much processing power, it is okay to use 8 bit processing. Nowadays, cell phone, media players, routers, they need 16 bit or 32 bit processors. That will be be fast, also, it has to do a lot of work. That means need a multiple process. And then, the next one is wireless, right? Suppose we want to connect a lot of devices using the wire. For example, your campus is this big. How big is your campus? Area? Area wise? So you might have about, uh, let's say, about 40, 50 classrooms, right? Suppose we want to connect all the classrooms to a central server, you have to run the game. Right? So it may not be possible all the time. So for example, our campus in the Hyderabad is about 12.5 acres. That is not that big. And the other campus in that I have been in, Bits campus in Hyderabad is 200 acres. Virginia Tech campus is 1600 acres. Right? So 1600 acres, you cannot run the wires. So it is better to go for wires. And similarly, you can carry around your laptop, cell phone, and uh, you can connect from anywhere. anywhere. So, the whole world is moving towards wireless. So your device has to be wireless. That means that your device has to have the capability on the device itself to communicate wirelessly. So it could be Bluetooth or short range, or it could be Zigbee, RFID, and so on. All of you are familiar with RFID, right? So nowadays uh, RFID is being used in uh, many of the products. And also the smart cards. Now suppose we want to get in some place, so they give you a RFID card. So that is for the short range, long range, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi, cellular, and so on. So I'll show you some examples. We have seen. So I've been working on this for about a few years. So then I could see that the, most of the companies are trying to integrate the wireless also into the same chip, same chip. So that is another important thing. One of the one of the examples we have given from uh, the Freescale semiconductors. And of course, almost all the companies have some product that improves the wireless also. And the main thing about the wireless is that it has to have, again, all these embedded systems are portable, right? So portable in the sense, your battery should not be too big, but battery should be small. 
At the same time, the battery has to last for a long time. One charge maybe has to last for about two days, one day, two days, and so on. So many companies advertise your uh, standby time is about two days, 52 hours, and so on. So another application is the sensor networks, right? In the sensor networks, you put a sensor somewhere. The sensor could be for an earthquake sensor, or maybe moisture sensor, or temperature sensor somewhere. These sensors have worked for only maybe two years. So it won't be transmitting the data all the time. If we transmit the data whenever there is a change in the data. So it will collect the data, keep it locally, and then it has to transmit, transmit to a base station. So you send a sensor or maybe plant a sensor somewhere, and then two years without change, the battery it has to work. Okay? So that means that whatever device that we are using, whatever chip we are using, it has to consume very low power. You will see that most of the companies have products that consume probably 1 to 2 micron amp when it is not transmitting data. When it is transmitting the data, it is going to be consuming a lot of cost, a lot of current, but that will be about 21% of the time. 99% of the time, it will go into the sleep mode, it will be consuming only about 1 to 2 micron amp of current. So there is very low, so uh, battery could last for about 2 years. That is especially true with the space application. For example, if you send something to the space, there is no way we can get it back. So it has to work as long as it should work. For example, the Mars probe that India sent, Mars mission. So it is supposed to work for about six months. Now it is working even after one year. So that is one reason. The embedded systems has to consume, has, <coughs> has to consume very low power. The other direction, again, I'm just giving an idea where the whole uh, embedded system is going. So one is multi-core processor, we want to have more processing power. And the second one is wireless, we cannot use the wire to connect. So we have to connect wirelessly to many devices or maybe a base station, maybe a modem, router or internet and so on. And then open source technology. So originally <coughs> when the company started introducing uh, cell phones, or embedded systems. They were using proprietary software, right? So the good example is Microsoft. Even now, Microsoft bought Nokia, right? Everybody is aware. So what operating system are they using? Nokia, Windows. How many of you are willing to buy phone with Windows? Some of you. How many of you are willing to buy phones with Android? Many of you, right? So the reason is that Android is an open source or OS. So that is available to all. You don't have to pay any royalty to anybody. It is not protected by trademark. Of course, uh, Google will give you Android application. And then many, many people develop application based on Android. So phones that use Android application, Android, Android OS and Android applications, they are more popular when compared to uh, Windows. I don't want to say anything bad about it.